Hey everybody, in this video we're going to talk about the ideas of event capturing and event bubbling in JavaScript. Now these concepts are very important to understand if you want to take control of the way that events fire in the DOM, and also simply to understand what's happening when we fire or trigger an event. So let's get going. So here on the left side of the screen I have my index.html file with some boilerplate HTML. Also, you can see here on line 6 that I'm linking to my styles.css file. And here on line 17, I'm linking to my JavaScript file, which I've called app.js. We'll be taking a look at those files in a second. But first, let's just take a look at some of the elements that I've laid out here in the body. So this is a very simple layout here. I have a div, or an outer div, with a class of container. And within that div, I have a single UL with two LIs. All right, so here you can see we have that outer div, which is represented here with this green border. This is the outer div with a class of container. And then within that, I have a UL represented here with this red border. And then within that, I have these two LIs, code creative and event bubbling and capturing. So let's take a look here on the right side of the screen now at the styles.css file. And I've created three rules for each of those elements, the container, the UL, and the LI. And for the sake of this video, these styles are really not important. They're basically serving to give some space to the elements and to create some borders, which will help us to visualize event capturing and event bubbling. So with that basic setup out of the way, let's talk about the idea of events in JavaScript and events in the DOM. So generally in a web application, you'll have all sorts of events that can occur. Events are things like mouse clicks or mouse overs, mouse enters, things like scroll events, resizing events. Right, these are all different events that the user can fire off or trigger via some kind of action that they take. And so in our code, we're going to be listening to these events and responding to them. So for example, if a user would click on a particular button, we would want to fire off some callback function in response to that click. But now let's talk about what actually happens when an event is fired. So the first thing that I want you to take notice of is that these elements here exist in a hierarchy of elements. In other words, these LIs are children of this parent UL element, and this parent UL element in turn is a child of this div with a class of container. And we can continue going up the hierarchy or the DOM tree, and we can get to the body element, which encloses all of these elements, and then upwards to the document and to the window object as well. So when we create our HTML, we're creating these hierarchies of grandparents to parents to child elements and so on. Now let's continue with this thought and let's visualize this in the browser. So here you can see we have the two LI elements and they're nested or wrapped in this UL element. And that UL element is nested inside of this container div. So if I set up one of these LIs to respond to a click event and the user clicks on one of these LIs, we can also say that the user has clicked on the UL and that the user has clicked on the enclosing container div. So again, if I'm clicking on the child element, I'm really clicking on all of the outer parent elements as well. And this brings us to the idea of event propagation. This idea of propagation, the word propagation basically means widely spreading. How this actually applies to DOM elements is that when an event is fired on a child element, that event actually propagates or spreads throughout the entire DOM hierarchy. And it does this in three different phases. The first one is the capture phase. The second one is the target phase. And the third one is the bubble phase. So let's talk a little bit about each of these phases. What you can see here is a representation of our DOM hierarchy. So from the top, we have the window, then we have the document, then the body, then the div, then the UL, and then the LI. So this is that structure that I mentioned previously about grandparents and parents and then child elements, with the child elements nested in the elements above them. Now let's say on that LI we're going to fire a click event. So that LI would be our target. But what happens actually when we fire that click event? Well, what happens is the capture phase. In the capture phase, the window element gets notified first of the click event, then going down the DOM tree, the document element gets notified next, and then the body element, and then the div, and then the UL, and then finally, that LI, which is the target, gets notified of the click event. And this is called the capture phase. Now once that LI, or target element, has been notified, we go back up the DOM tree, 
in what's called the bubble or bubbling phase. So as you can see here, these elements are notified once again, however this time in reverse order. So after the target element has been notified, we ascend back up the DOM tree to the UL, to the div, the body, the document, and then the window. And these here represent the three phases of event propagation. Why is this idea of event propagation and these three event phases important to know? Well, let's say that we set up a click event listener on the LI or the target element. And we set up our event listener so that when we clicked on the LI, a callback function would be run. Well, let's say that we had also set up a click event listener on the div. And as well, we set up this event listener to invoke a callback function on that click event. Well, in that case, both the callback function associated with the click event on the LI would run as well as the callback function associated with the click event on the div. Now as developers, we have the ability to decide whether or not we want to trigger events during the capture phase or during the bubble phase. And when we use the add event listener method, as we'll see shortly, the event listeners default to firing in the bubble phase. So in other words, the target element will fire first, its callback will be run, and then in this case, the div element would be fired next and its callback function would be run. If, however, we decided not to use the default bubbling, but rather wanted to use the capture phase, then it's the div element that would fire its callback first, and then the li target element would fire its callback. So as developers, we have the option which one of these phases we want to work with. And so we can determine the order in which we want the callbacks to fire. All right, now let's try actually working with these concepts in our code. We'll look at event bubbling first. So in order to see event bubbling in action, what I'm going to do is I'm going to set up an event listener on this LI here. I'm going to set it up to listen for a click event, but I'm also going to set up a click event here on this UL. And I'm also going to set up a click event here on this outer div with the class of container. So remember with event bubbling, when we fire an event on a child element, like this LI is here, any parent elements that are listening for the same type of event will fire as well as the event notification bubbles up the DOM tree. So the first thing I want to do in my JavaScript file is I want to select these three elements. So let's create a const called container. We'll use document.querySelector to grab a reference to it. And then we'll also get the UL element using document.querySelector as well. And for the LI, let's get a reference to that one as well. And we'll use querySelector to select the LI. Now my li is going to be the target element, the one that I'm going to actually click on. So I'm going to use add event listener on that element to listen for a click event. And when that click event fires, I'm just going to log to the console, li clicked. Let's copy this code so we can do the same thing for the ul element. So we'll do ul.addEventListener. This will also listen for a click event. And here we'll log out ul clicked. And then finally, let's get the container and do the exact same thing by adding an event listener to the container and on click, fire an event that logs container click to the console. So as I mentioned, the bubbling phase is the default phase used with add event listener. So what order do you think these events are going to fire? What order should we see these messages logged to the console? Well, let's flip over to the browser and let's click on the LI and let's take a look in the console. So as you might have guessed, because of bubbling, we first get li clicked, then we get ul clicked, and then we get container clicked. Because my click event on the li bubbled up to each of the parent elements, and when it notified those parent elements that a click event occurred, those parent elements fired off their callback functions. Now I told you before that we also have access to the capture phase. And because of that, we can actually alter the order in which these events fire. So right now in the bubbling phase, we're going from child to parent to parent, bubbling upward from the child element. However, let's try something. Let's try setting the container and the UL element to get notified during the capture phase. And this way, their callback functions will be fired first before the target element. So in order to do that, what you should know is that with the add event listener method, we can pass in as a third argument, a Boolean value. So if we pass in true as that value, that means that we want this callback function to fire on the capture phase for this element. Let's also set the UL to fire on the capture phase. 
So now if I click the LI, in what order should we see these console logs appear in the console? Well, let's go ahead and try it out. Keep your eyes on the console as I click the LI. Notice that we first get container clicked, and then UL clicked, and then LI clicked. And remember, since we passed in true as a third argument to the container element and the UL element, we're saying when the LI is clicked, notify the container first on the capture phase and fire its callback. And then as we descend down the DOM hierarchy, fire the UL next, and then finally fire the target. So by using that third parameter, we can change the order in which events are fired. So this third argument, by default, it's false. If we just leave it out of here, it's false, and that means that we're going to use the bubbling phase. Now another way to pass this in, which will produce the exact same result, is to pass in an options object with a key of capture and a value set to true. So let's use that on both the UL and the container. Let's go back to the browser to verify that this works. And here again, we see a container clicked, UL clicked, and LI clicked. The reason why you might want to pass it in this way is because this third parameter is an options object that can actually include other parameters as well. Now there may be some situations in which you don't want this propagation to occur, or you want to limit the extent to which it occurs. And for this we have a method called stop propagation. So let's see how it would work. First of all, when we use the add event listener method, the callback function that we pass in automatically gets access to an event object. And it's on that event object that we can call the stop propagation method. So remember, we have this container, the outer container here, set with capture to true. We also have the child UL here set with its capture to true. So normally, if we clicked on the li child element, the container's callback would fire first, and then that would propagate down to the next child element, which is the UL, and its callback would fire. However, with event.stoppropagation, what should happen is that only the callback on the container element should fire and go no further. So if that's true, when we click the li, we should only see in the console container clicked. So let's go back to the browser and see if this works. So let's click on the LI and check out the console. And we get container clicked. We get nothing further because we set propagation to stop after the container elements callback was fired. One of the main reasons why event bubbling and capturing is useful is because we can use it for something called event delegation. To explain event delegation, I'm going to start out by getting rid of all this code here. And I'm going to get rid of the query selectors for the UL and the LI as well. Now let's say for these LIs, I wanted to add an event listener to each one of them, because when I click on each one, I want to log out the text content to the console. So if I clicked on this one, I would log out the code creative. If I clicked on this one, I'd log out event bubbling and capturing. And imagine that we had a whole bunch of these LIs. Well, your first instinct might be to select each one of these or loop through all of them and add event listeners to each one of them. However, now that we know in particular about event bubbling, what we can do is simply add the event listener to the parent element, the container element, and because the callback function associated with this event listener gives us access to the event object, we can use the target property on that event object to tell us exactly which one of these LIs was clicked on. So let's give it a shot and you'll see what I mean. So in order for this to work, we definitely need to get a reference to the container element since that's going to be the parent. And what we'll do is we'll set up our event listener on that container. And we're going to listen out for a click event. And remember I said that callback function, it automatically receives the event object. And one of the properties on that event object is the target property. And that target property lets us know exactly which one of the child elements was clicked on, which one was the target. So in this case, we can console.log out the event.target. And let's say event.target.text content, since we want to get this text content in each of the tags. So let's go to the browser and see if this is working for us. So let's click on the code creative and check out the console. And we see the code creative. And then let's click on event bubbling and capturing. And in the console, we see event bubbling and capturing. So because of this phenomenon of event propagation, we avoided having to do all this code duplication of adding event listeners to each individual LI, and instead we just listen for the parent element, 
And we use the fact that it captures all the way down to the child element, which then bubbles up all the way back to the parent element to determine exactly which element or target was clicked on. So this is something that's done all the time in code, and hopefully now you have a better understanding of exactly how it works. So in this video, we learned all about event propagation. We learned about the three phases of event propagation, capturing, target, and bubbling. We saw how we can control or set which one of the phases we want to work with in order to control the order in which events are fired. And then we also saw how this can be put to very real use by way of event delegation. So if you enjoyed this video, if you feel like you got some value out of it, please give the video a like, consider subscribing to the channel, and let me know in the comments down below if there are any topics you'd like to see covered. See you next time.